family, welcome back to Coventry United TV, the exclusive home of the red and greens for another trip down memory lane with our new interview series, CUTV's Team Talk. Today we're talking to another former Coventry United star whose spectacular goals and breathtaking pace made him an instant hit with the red and green army during his sole season with the club player who came so close to uh, hitting the heights in the Football League with uh, Coventry City before being released in 2014 and accepting a new challenge of taking on the non-league pyramid. If you haven't guessed who it is yet, we are talking about Lewis Rankin. He's my guest this week. Now, Rank spent one season with Coventry United between 2017 and 2018, scoring 13 goals in 36 starts. And... Quite honestly, he's got to go down as one of my favourite Coventry United players and it's been great covering him since uh, during some of my independent work as well. And those performances were really a highlight of the 2017-18 season where a really talented squad could have potentially gone up if it wasn't for a bit of a winter blip. Uh, along with his time at Coventry United, we're going to be talking about his uh, experiences and departure from Coventry City, as well as his journeys in non-league and what is next for Lewis Rankin. I'll hand it over to Ranks now. Take it away. Ranks, great to talk to you as always. First off, how have you been during the difficult time that has been locked down? How you doing, Leon? Yeah, good to speak to you too, mate. I hope you're keeping well. I hope everybody's keeping well. Um, yeah, mate, I've not been too bad. It's been a... It's been a crazy year, if I'm honest. Um, it's been a bit of a weird one for everyone, I suppose, mentally. Um, been on and off work with furlough, being in, being off. Um, I'm now back in full time. I have been for a couple months now, so it's good to have that routine back. Um, for me personally, um, I've kept myself busy in terms of I've got into running somehow. I just managed to get into going out running and stuff. It made me feel better mentally. So that's really helped me keep sane this last year, I suppose. Well, thankfully, the restrictions are being lifted over the next couple of weeks. Are you excited to be getting back on the pitch? I think for anyone, if you if you ain't looking forward to going back to football and having that match day feeling on a Saturday and getting the three points and the banter with the lads, like, pff, pff, football ain't for you, man. Like, pff, honest to God, there is not a better thing than winning football matches on a Saturday. Not so much the Tuesday night games away from home when you've been on a long day at work and that, but, yo, I'll tell you what, I won't ever take that for granted again. I'll happily travel an hour down the road on a Tuesday night for a game because... Wow, like, I missed it big time and I can't wait to get back playing again. On to your footballing career. Now, you're certainly one of the more uh, gifted players that I've had the, uh, the joy of commentating on. Uh, how did you grow and nurture that gift as a child? <laughs> I appreciate that, Liam. Um, I'll take the compliment from you because I know there is many gifted players that have played at Cov United and still playing at Cov United. There's loads of serious players there, so I'll take that from you. Yeah, um, when I was young, me and my dad, we used to play in the street and he just used to teach me all the basics of football, control, pass, control, pass, touch out your feet and all of that kind of stuff. And then obviously, I was at a team called the 87 and we had a really good team. We was always getting in finals of tournaments, winning tournaments, going really far and stuff. And um, that's where I got scouted for Cov. And obviously being at Cov from the age of seven all the way up to 19, I'm, I've, been, I've been trained really well, technically. So that's probably why <clears throat> you say I'm more of a gifted player because I've probably had I've had all this training for so many years, so it's helped me in the long run. So the player I am now, I'm, I would say I'm more of a, I like to create things, I like to make things happen and stuff like that. Of course, you're a Coventry born and bred, you're a local lad, and for most aspiring footballers from Coventry, the dream 
is to play for the Sky Blues of Coventry City. And you had that chance when you progressed through the ranks of the Coventry City Youth Academy. Uh, talk us through how your big break came to be. Yeah, obviously being a local lad um, and coming through the ranks at such a young age at Cov, um, it meant a lot to me, my family and stuff. Um, I've been coached well for so many years and just I dedicated my life so much to football, especially from, like I'd say it gets serious at under 15s because you start playing a few years above yourself every now and then and you're trying to impress in every game, every training session. So it was a really, really unbelievable achievement for me to obviously get my one year professional contract, which didn't work out to what I wanted in the end, but um, still 100% one of the best achievements I've got and I have absolutely no regrets at all. I never, I don't think back and say, like, I wish I'd done this better, I wish I tried harder and anything like that. I have absolutely no regrets whatsoever. It just didn't work out in the long run. I'm sure everyone would love to hear about your experiences with Coventry City. Was it really an environment that you thrived in? So, Obviously, before I got my first year professional contract, you have to do a two year um, like scholarship before you get your decision. And that you you literally you're a, you're a full time footballer. Obviously, you're not getting paid like what a footballer would get paid. You're on like apprenticeship wage, but it's where you live, breathe football. You have your certain jobs to do throughout the day like for example mine was to do the kit so I'd have to put all the kit in the pigeonholes with the correct numbers for the lads and stuff like that but honestly if somebody offered me to go back to being an apprentice right now at Cov 100% I'd snap their hand off and take it because they are honestly one of my best memories in football that I have 100% and then when I made it professional I obviously moved from so we were based as a scholar i was based at the higgs the Allen higgs center and then professionally i moved to um obviously Wrighton, which is class facilities the pitch the changing rooms massive you have your own little designated area um, the kit man brings you your kit your towel even slips to put on so you don't have to wash your dirty boxes and stuff like Honestly, it's such a professional environment. Um, you've got your own gym. Um, we come in, you come in earlier and the chef's done breakfast. So you go and have your breakfast. And like, I'm not just talking cereal, like you have the choice. You can have whatever you want kind of thing. We'd always go down um, before training and do our rehab work. So loads of stuff on the legs. Again, everything's like tailored for what? you need so the sports scientist really takes a look on what they think you need to work on more it's just it's just class and um everything you're training out you're doing something you love every single day you're getting fed like you're getting looked after like honest to god the lifestyle was just unbelievable and of course, some of your former teammates uh, in the youth and senior teams uh, have gone on to great things. I mean, looking back, who were the players uh, that you knew would be future stars? Yeah, so obviously I was lucky enough to play with some of these top, top players that are in the game now, like the likes of Callum Wilson. When I did my first year pro there, he was um, he was obviously flying at Cov. And uh, then he got his move to Bournemouth. I think at, I think at the end of that season, I was let go. Um, James Madison, he was always a couple of years younger than me, but he was, he would play in our under 18s games sometimes or the under 21s games because he was, he, you could just tell, like, even the way he kicked the ball, like, he was just technically gifted. Um, and you just, you knew he was going to go right to the very top and he deserves everything he gets from, from here on out because, People don't under, people don't people that don't like are not really into football. They just think that like the lifestyle. Obviously, they get paid so much money and whatnot. But the sacrifices you have to make to get to the top, like 
only one percent of like people in academies make that and he is that one percent like okay a lot of a lot of other lads have made it to a really good level you've got players in championship um efl there's players playing good levels non-league but only a certain percent make it to the very top and obviously james madison and callum wilson deserve every everything they get from here on out because i know I know what it took for me just to do a one year a one year pro. So for them to go again and again and again and especially with Callum because I think it took him three seasons to make his debut for Cov or get a good run of games. Like I think at the time if if you was if you was to ask anybody at the time in his like age group do you think that he's going to make it to the top? Probably not many people would have said yes. But that just proves like, to always, always keep going because eventually your time will come and fair play to him. Man, he's absolutely smashed it. I'm really happy for, for the two of them and all the lads that have done really well. You were involved in uh, several match day squads. You trained with the first team on a regular basis. Uh, but that first appearance for Coventry uh, was just out of touch. Uh, is, it, is there an air of frustration uh, looking back, knowing that you were so close? Yeah, so I was involved in in all like the match day squads and stuff. I only think I made the bench four times that whole season. And... Um, yeah, training and stuff. Uh, I felt like I never looked out of place. Like I, I knew I belonged. I knew I belonged there. Like, and it was always to a good standard, really good tempo and stuff. And you always, you come up, you come back in the change room knowing you've had a good training session. Like it's been a good blow, and stuff. Um, in terms of the match day squads, like, yeah, of course it's, it was frustrating. I've to start with. I was buzzing to be a part of it just to experience the match day the match day feeling with a first team in the changing room before the game warming up and stuff like that but after a while when you're not making the squad when you're not making the bench sorry um it gets it gets frustrating because you feel like you're doing all you can in training and that's you're doing all you can in the under 21s games um you're doing all you can in terms of extras coming in on your days off and stuff, hoping that the gaffer may see that you're you're doing everything you possibly can to get in his eye. And obviously my opportunity personally didn't come for whatever reason. I believe that if I was given that one opportunity, then things could have been a lot different. But it's it's all about football's all about opinions really and Obviously, it didn't work out in the end, but like I said earlier, I have absolutely no regrets. I've done everything I possibly could to try and establish myself in the COF first team. While at City, you uh, experienced international football by playing for the Scotland under-19s. Uh, it must have been an honour to play for a country so close to your family's heart. Uh, yeah, I remember that... Um... That Scotland in the nineteen call up. Um, that was we went to like a training camp thing. I think it was for a couple of days, and um, that was real. That was such a good experience. You had players there, uh, players that are still playing now in the Premier League. You have um, Ollie McBurney, who's at Sheffield United, who's obviously part of the Scotland first team squad, and um, Scott McTominay. He was there, who's obviously. Um, part of the Scotland squad as well. Um, yeah, that I can't actually remember how the opportunity came in terms of me getting a call up, but I was never going to say I was never going to say no. It was a chance to showcase my my ability to more people. So it was never a question of oh, like I don't think I'm going to go because for whatever reason. And um, yeah, I loved it. It was. A really, really good experience. 
your Sky Blue adventure came to an end uh, in the summer of 2014 when you were released, uh, as well as uh, striker Ben Mourned. Uh, the manager at the time, Stephen Presley, challenged you to prove him wrong. Uh, was that the ambition from that point, to prove Stephen Presley wrong? Well, I'll be honest, I knew I was getting released from more or less the first few weeks in training because me and the gaffer, Stephen Presley, um, we didn't really see eye to eye. Let's just put it that way. And um, it is what it is. It's part and parcel of football. Some managers you get on with, some you don't. We didn't really have a great relationship. All from the very start, of pre-season it was because I was injured so I was really behind with my fitness and stuff so I was always playing catch up and stuff um so obviously eventually once I was fit and rearing and stuff and playing in the under 21s it got to a stage where I was actually getting dropped in my under in under 21 games which was my age group and that season I was I was actually top goal scorer for the under 21s but I wasn't starting in the games, which I found really bizarre. So there was one day, this was a few months before the end of the season, I just went up to the gaffer's office and I said, I said, look, Clark, am I in your plans for next season? Because I want to know now, because I need to give myself the best opportunity to find somewhere else, if that is the case. And fair play to him at the time. He was, he was brutally honest, honest with me and said, like, no, like he's going to be getting rid of me kind of thing so I'm really glad that I give myself that couple of months he said that I could stay till the end of the season obviously to keep my fitness up and training and if there's any trials or anything that I can happily he will happily let me go to them and stuff which was good and um yeah of course like it, in a sense it broke me a little bit in terms of I was there from the age of seven to 19 to have gone through all that sacrifice and not get a single minute on the pitch. Like, it hurt, of course, but my ambition wasn't to wasn't to prove anybody wrong. Like, it, that's his opinion, go and prove me wrong. But I'll be honest, I'm not entirely bothered about his opinion. I know I've done everything I possibly could, so it is what it is. Um... But in terms of trials, I went to, Jesus, this, I'm thinking back now. I went to Brentford for a week. I went to Oxford. I think I went to Peterborough. Um, I can't, there was loads more places, but my last place I went, I went up to Hamilton in Scotland. And that was literally my best trial I've, I've ever had. And I thought, I am guaranteed getting offered something here. Because, honestly, training, and I think there was a game that I had to play in, like a reserve game or in the 20s game. And I think I scored two in that game or something like that. And I thought, I'm 100% I'm getting offered something here. And then I spoke to the gaffer after the two weeks I was there. And um, he said that he doesn't think I'm physically, physically ready for the Scottish League which really shocked me. Obviously, I was I was smaller than that, so obviously I wasn't that physical of a player, but I thought, I thought my feet and ability throughout them two weeks would have done the talking, but obviously it's just someone out, someone's opinion. It's not what I wanted to hear, and that drive back from Scotland with my dad, that's what really broke me in terms of I stopped playing football for a good three to four months because I thought it was just never going to happen again. Do you feel that uh, Presley made the right decision or did you feel you had more to give? He would say yes because obviously he obviously didn't think I was good enough. Um, I will say no because I didn't get given the opportunity to know if I was or wasn't good enough. So I could accept if he'd given me a 10 minute cameo on the pitch one time and I give the ball away five times and I was awful and whatnot. But that's, that's the only thing I couldn't accept. I couldn't accept the fact that I'd been let go and I actually hadn't had, hadn't been given a moment on the pitch 
to see if I actually was good enough. That was the only thing that I didn't agree with and I thought was quite unfair. But in terms of did it come as a surprise? No, not at all, because I knew it was coming. That's why I went and seen him months before I knew, months before we were being told about our contracts, because I knew, I knew he, he wasn't really having me. So it is what it is, really. Once you left Coventry City, you headed for non-league and you joined Rugby Town uh, for the first of three stints with the Valley. Uh, did you just want to get back into playing football or was the ambition to stay in the EFL? Yeah, so obviously once I was let go, I went on trial all these places and stuff. And um, every every single club I went was given the same answer in terms of you're not physically you're not physically ready or we like what we see but we haven't got the money for you but I, I don't believe in I don't believe in that kind of stuff. I feel I feel they're horrific reasons. Like that's why I, I kinda quit football for three months because I couldn't accept the reason of you're not big enough, you're not physically strong enough or we haven't got the money to offer you any offer you a contract but we think you we think you're a really gifted player and stuff like that's what I couldn't get my head around I'd rather somebody be brutally honest and say listen you ain't good enough like it's as simple as that I'd literally rather somebody say that to my face plain and simple you ain't good enough so yeah I stopped playing for a couple months and then somehow I can't remember how the gaffer at rugby got in touch with me. But um, I remember he'd, I didn't want to play non-league at all. I thought, no, I'm not going to non-league. I want to go back to full-time football professionally. Um, but at, by this time, I had no one to contact to get trials and stuff like that. So he invited me down to a training session and um, at rugby. And I remember the first day of the training session, my dad took me and it was raining like wow I've never seen rain like it and the the lads were out there on the AstroTurf like just having a kick about before training I was like oh, dad I don't really want to go and he was like go like you will enjoy it kind of thing so I've gone training and honestly I was I thought like at the time I was I'd just come out of professional football I thought I'm too good to be here I had that kind of mentality and then um Started training with the lads. They all made me feel really welcome and stuff. And I was so surprised at how good the standard was. Like it was, it was like training with the first team. Like obviously they're not as fit as what the Cov first team and stuff was, but in terms of everybody on the ball, technically bopping the ball around and stuff, like it was, it was class and. The gaffer after the training session was like, what did you think? And I was like, mate, where do I sign? Because I really enjoyed it. So I signed there and um, the lads there were class. We had a, we had a really good team. Um, I think we just missed out on the playoffs that season as well. And it was just good to get playing again and start enjoying my football again, if I'm honest. I think it's fair to say your stint at rugby was rather successful. Uh, then in the years that followed, uh, you lined up for the likes of the uh, Coventry Spinks, Brackley and Chase Town. When I went to Chase Town, it was the gaffer from when I first went to rugby. He went to be the Chase Town gaffer and he, he, me and him had a really good relationship. Um, he really liked me and he, he f seemed like he really wanted me to go with him to Chase Town. But... Um, that didn't work out in the end in t with the terms of travelling and stuff to the games. It was a bit too out the way. And then, obviously, Spinks at the time had a great squad with Robbie Banco. I think Pigs was there at the time. Uh, Rich Blythe, obviously really local. Um, great bunch of lads. So that was a good... That was I really enjoyed my time there. <coughs> um, I think I've... I think I ended up top goal scorer for the season. In terms of league position and that, we didn't finish in a great place. I think we just um just survived, to be fair. 
but I did in, I did enjoy my time there. And then I made a big... I can't remember if I went from Spinks straight to Brackley. But um, Brackley at the time, I had to go on trial there because they were in the Conference North. And it's a, a lot more a lot more professional. Not in terms of the standard. The standard of players, like, obviously they're better. But they're a lot fitter. The tempo's a lot quicker and stuff like that. And that was kind of like, right, if I can get in here, this is a stepping stone of trying to go again. But, um, yeah, of course, there was players there who were really experienced for the level. And it's a really good level, the Conference North. I don't care what anybody says in terms of non-league. The Conference North is a unbelievable level if you're playing at that week in, week out. Um, didn't really work out for me there in terms of... <coughs> um, the formation we played, we played three five, three five two, so there was wing backs. So I wasn't re I wasn't gonna play wing back. And the two wing backs that did play were athletes, so they were class. And the lad that played in the pocket behind the strikers, he was top goal scorer, scoring all the time, getting assists. So there was no way I was getting ahead of him. And then the lad who was like second to the number 10 top goal scorer. He's like, he's, in my opinion, he was good enough to play in the Football League, but he was actually on the bench quite a lot for Brackley. So it was, it was always going to be a tough ass to try and break into that team. And again, obviously, you, had, you start to get a bit frustrated and stuff with not playing and stuff. But... um. Yeah, I, I did really enjoy my time there. We had a really good squad. Whenever When I was asked to play, I thought I'd done well. I just didn't get the run I, th I wanted in the side. Of course, there are a lot of players out there who uh, jump from uh, team to team every season in non-league. Uh, you've had a couple of clubs yourself. Uh, how difficult can it be to settle into a new team, a new environment and find a real home in non-league? In at non-league level, you can <coughs> obviously you can chop and change. Clubs are kind of like it's kind of like as many times as you want, but you need to. I've realised now that you need to kind of be settled somewhere. It doesn't actually matter what level you're playing at. Um, I just believe as if you're happy and that club make you feel, make you feel like you. They want you there, like they they need you there, like that is all you need. And if you're playing, good bunch of lads, like it doesn't matter what level. Because in terms of step six is where I'm at now at Hinkley, to step three where I was at Nuneaton, um a couple of seasons ago, there's not that much of a difference. It's just in terms of the tempo is a lot quicker and stuff like that. But there is some really good players from step six, five, four, and three. And I know I can play at any any of them levels, but it's at the end of the day, it's where I'm happy, and where I'm ha where I'm happy at the moment is Hinkley because they make me feel like wanted there. So it's definitely important to get settled somewhere. In the summer of 2017, you arrived at Coventry United. How important was it to hit the ground running at your new club? It was actually quite mad how I signed for Coventry United because I wasn't I wasn't supposed to I was I was actually signing for Stratford I remember and um, I played in a Copswood tournament ages ago now and um, Terry was there obviously Coventry United gaffer and um, he, we just got chatting and he literally just sold it to me <coughs> obviously I knew a lot of the lads there. Aaron Wint was going and Dom was there. So I was just like, you know what? Why not? It's local. Like, seems like a good bunch of lads, whatnot. So I just went for it. And um the players we was the players Terry was signing, we were like, Jesus, we're gonna have a really good squad. So it was important to kind of cement my place in terms of right, I wanna be playing here every single week. I wanna be scoring, assisting. And obviously our target that season was to try and get promoted because 
I feel, I still feel that we had a good enough squad to do that at the time. The squad at the time housed some some big names: uh, Chris Cox, Gib Musa, uh, Kev Thornton, uh, to name a couple. Uh, what do you feel that team could have accomplished? The squad at the time with Pigs, Reedy, Gift, Kev, Coxy. There was there was loads of the lads. Uh, Winty. Um, yeah, our, our target at the start of the season was we we need to go and win this league and get promoted. That was the target from the get go, and um, at the start we was absolutely flying. I think we won our first eight or nine on the bounce, and we were, we were absolutely flying. And then <coughs> injuries happen, players leave, new players come in. Uh, people get complacent. Like, long story short, we, as a squad, as a group of players, we did underachieve that season in the end after having such an unbelievable start. Like, I was going into every game at the start of the season thinking nobody is going to beat us because we were flying. But yeah, we definitely underachieved and I'd love to... I would have loved to have gone back to that season again and put it right. While your opening months at Coventry United were spectacular, I think it started to fade away around Christmas time uh, for yourself and the team. What were the contributing factors behind this? That was a, it's a difficult one, really. Um, in terms of, on a personal level for me, I was flying up until, up until Christmas. And then... Um, I don't know. I don't know what it was. Performances dropped, and then maybe my head would go a little bit. Um, maybe I got a bit too complacent in terms of. I knew I was probably going to be starting the games where it's that's a really bad attitude to have. You should always should always feel like you've earned your start instead of just expecting your start so um yeah i probably got a little bit complacent and so did probably some of the other lads um would lose a few games people's heads start to go confidence drops um i think i went for a step i didn't score for ages after christmas i think i scored i think i scored 13 goals that season and 10 were before Christmas and only three after. So obviously my confidence dropped. There would have been other lads. Um, lads would have left. New lads coming in. Um, maybe not hitting the ground running straight away. And then we were just playing catch up really. And it was never, it was never going to happen for us in the end. At the end of the 2017-18 season, you sought uh, a new challenge and left the club. Looking back, do you feel it was the right decision? Yeah, so at the end of the season, I did decide to leave and I went back to rugby. Cause, so before I signed for Cov United, I was meant to go to Stratford with um, Carl Adams, who was the manager. And he then wanted me to go rugby the season after. And I thought, I, I can't let him down again. So I agreed to go Stratford and let him down. So... I agreed to go rugby at the end of the season. Um, in terms of was it the right decision, I'm going to say yes, because I could, I could not play another game on the Butts pitch again. Um, I loved my time at Cov United, loved the lads, loved Terry. Fans were brilliant. They, they um, proper got behind me and stuff, but it was a rugby pitch, like... The bubbles on it was horrible, especially as you're getting closer towards the end of the season. It was, wasn't was a nice pitch to play on. Obviously, now that's changed. Um, it's now a 4G, which obviously suits my game. And if you look at every, you look at every club I've been at since Cov United, all of the home pitches have been really, really good. Like my type of pitch, because I like to get the ball down and play, create and more more of a technical based game so you've got rugby obviously nice pitch um who else have i been at <laughs> Nuneaton, 
obviously their pitch is nice. Cozil 4G. Um, and now, now currently at Hinkley, who they're getting their pitch changed to 4G for next season. So it's going to suit me again. So for me, choosing a club is one thing, but the pitch for me is is another because I I could not face another game playing on that bubble at the Butts. But um, if it was 4G when I was there, hundred percent I would have stayed. One million percent I would have stayed. But um, it is what it is. With the benefit of hindsight, is there anything that you would do differently in your Coventry United career? Um, in terms of, would there be anything I'd done different at um, Cov United? Yeah, um, of course I would have. I wouldn't have come more complacent in um, the fact that I knew I was probably going to be starting. Um, it's not. It's better to be pushed. And always have the mentality of like you've earned your spot to start and to always perform every week kind of thing. But um, I took that as a big as a big lesson, to be honest, into my next chapter and where I played at rugby. Talk us through some of your favourite memories in the red and green of Coventry United. I've been I've been looking forward to this question. To be fair, um, obviously I've got I'm going to pinpoint four. Um, all for different reasons. So the corn one, I can't remember what the score was. Was it seven or eight nil? Something like that. No, I think we conceded one. But um, obviously because of my goal the with my right peg, I scored two that game, but that one with my right peg is probably one of my best goals I've ever scored in my life. Um, so I've got that one for that reason. Um, Worcester at home towards the start of the season. Worcester were like talked about to win the league. They, everyone was talking about them winning the league and stuff. <coughs> and I think we were both seven, six or seven games in. Both had maximum points. Um, they hadn't conceded a goal, or they hadn't. They conceded very little goals, like two goals in seven games or something like that. And they come to our place and we popped them three nil. Scored in that game as well, and that was that was kind of like wow, like. We mean business this season, like that was probably the game where I thought we're gonna fly through this league. Nobody's touching us, kind of thing, which could have been the start of complacency coming. Us thinking that it was too easy, but at the time, like that was such a good feeling. That game, um, FA Var, I think it was the Vars game. We played Lutterworth away, and they had loads of. Loads of lads there, but um, at the side, behind the dugouts and that, I remember they were singing to Dom. He's got a pineapple on his head. Um, I think he got sent off that game actually, and we were poor. We were so poor. Did not deserve anything out of that game, and somehow showed a togetherness to come back. And I think Pigs got the equaliser. And he was giving it Ben 10 in front of the lads. And then um, Reedy scored the winner and literally the last kick of the game. And I remember everybody ran to the corner and was screaming like that was, that's up there with one of the best feelings. You can't get a better feeling than winning a game in the last kick. Like unbelievable. And my last one, um, even though it ended in heartbreak, um, has got to be the Bromsgrove, Bromsgrove Sporting Vars replay at our place. Like, for a starters, how did how we managed to get a replay is beyond me because at their place we drew one one and we got absolutely battered. And I think didn't the I think the first leg went to extra time, so we'd already played one hundred and twenty minutes on the Saturday, and then on the Wednesday. The replay was at our place and we were 3-0 down at half-time. Dead and buried. Been absolutely popped. Terry's obviously gone mad at half-time at us and told us to wake up and whatnot and have a go. And it's took us till the, probably what, the 70th, 75th minute to have a little go. I made it 3-1 with a free kick, but I've crossed it and it's just missed everyone. And 
like how we come back that was unbelievable like the fans there was loads of people there actually all got behind us um obviously unfortunately it ended in heartbreak i put my pen wide which i was fuming about but um yeah that was a bit of sweet moment but it was a good i'll look back at it now like yeah what a what a game you're still fighting fit and playing some great football. I remember during my uh, time at Bedworth a couple of years ago that uh, you played for Kozel Town against the Greenbacks at the Oval. And personally, I thought you were the best player on the pitch. So are your best years still ahead of you? Of course, you're only 25. So what can we expect next? Yeah, I, I remember that game. I remember that game very well where we we popped Bedworth 3-2. I, I took that game quite personal, actually, because a few weeks before I signed for Kozel, um, I was actually meant to sign for Bedworth and long story short, the gaffer didn't think I was fit enough, which I probably wasn't, if I'm honest. So he was right, but it, you get fit by playing games at the end of the day, I think. Obviously, you can do as much training as you want, but in terms of playing football matches, it's a different type of fitness. Um, and then Cam at Cozy will give me my chance, played me in games and when... When that game Bedworth come along, I couldn't wait to play that game and I was buzzing I scored and I was buzzing we won that game. So, yeah, um, in terms of am my best years ahead of me, well, I ain't that old yet. <laughs> I'm 25, 26 in July. Yeah, I've got what loads more years left in me. Obviously, I've been training quite a lot over the lockdown and stuff and in terms of my fitness, I feel... I feel as if I'm in probably the best shape I have been for a, a long time, if I'm honest. Probably over the last five years, I'm in the best shape I've possibly been in. But I haven't got into this shape for football. I've just got into this mentality. I've just got into this like fitness kind of thing for me. So if it helps me with my football, then that's a bonus as well. More recently, you've made an impression with uh, Hinkley in Division 1. Uh, is the plan to stay with Hinkley for next season? What is next for Lewis Rankin? Yeah, so obviously the last few months I've been <coughs> at Hinkley before we went into a lockdown. Um, in terms of, it was a bit of a big decision in terms of, oh, look, I kind of didn't want to go and play at Step 6 because I know I'm good enough to play at step five, step four and step three. But it for me, it was about just playing regular, feeling wanted um, and enjoying it. And that's exactly what what's happened for me at Hinkley. We were doing well in the league as well. Um, in terms of what's next, um, I'll be I'll be probably be staying at Hinkley. Um, we're changing our, uh, getting the, Bar while they're getting their pitch done as a 4G, so that suits me to a T. We've got a good set of lads there, some good young players which will go on and play at a good level of football, who all like to get the ball down and play. Obviously, we've got the some experienced older heads there as as well, but um, all round we do have a good squad and we we should have a really good go next season, and hopefully look at um, hopefully go for a promotion. Um, in terms of what's next now, um, I'm just going to plug this now. I'm, I'm actually doing a little run next week on the 14th of April for, for prostate cancer. I'm raising money for charity. Um, if you follow my Facebook, Lewis Rankin, or my Instagram, run the number four underscore prostate cancer 16. Um, my link's on there, which you can click on. <clears throat> and see what I'm doing. I'm going to be running um, four miles every four hours for 48 hours, which is going to be absolutely disgusting. But um, I've had loads of support from people so and messages and some people have offered to come and do a couple of the runs with me and whatnot. And um, I've raised <coughs> I've raised over £3,000, which I'm absolutely buzzing about. So if anybody, if anybody watching this, um, please go and have a look at my Facebook or my Instagram page, which I just said, um, and um, donate even if it's a pound. Like any donations are, 
it's better than nothing. So I really would appreciate it because it's prostate cancer is something really close to my heart. And finally, over the last few weeks, we've been asking uh, players at Coventry United, past and present, to name their Coventry United all-time best 11. I know you've been wanting to do it for a while, so uh, take it away, Lewis. All-time United 11. Right, so I'm going to do... I'm only going to do it with the players that I played with. So I can rule out some of the lads that are there now because I know a lot of them are really good players and stuff, but I didn't play with them. Um, so I go with Mozer in goal, left back, Hoodie. In my opinion, Hoodie, when I was there, he was really young and a bit raw, but he was class, had such a good attitude and stuff as well. And he was good, good round the changing room and stuff like that. We used to have a bit of banter together and stuff. And he's just grew and grew and grew and got so much better. So, yeah, for me, Hoodie is one of the best left-backs for that level all day long. But then I've got Ben Valance as well. Was, oh, my God, Ben. I'm going to have to leave out Ben. I'm... Sorry, Ben. <laughs> um, Centre-halves, I'm going to have to put KB in because he's one of my best mates and he'll start crying if I don't put him in. So, KB, Kyle Barnett, that is. Um, I'll go with Jammer who is the most laid-back defender I've ever played football with, but class. So good on the ball, defensively, could head it, kick it, but could also play as well. Um, right back, I'm going to put Dom there. Dom is so underrated. Like He is so unappreciated. He is such a good player, so versatile. And the loudest man on the football pitch, to the point where it's slightly annoying, but you you need that kind of leader on the pitch. So Dom is 100% in my team. Um, centre mids, I'm just going to do 4 4 2. Centre mids, I'll put Coxie and Gift. Absolute energy is all I need to say. Gifty, an absolute monster. Coxie, an absolute monster. Nobody else needs to do any running. <laughs> um, on the wing, right side, I'll put um, right side. Oh, Mr. Cov United, Josh O'Grady, 100%, absolute dead ball specialist. And at the time I was there, he was sharp, really sharp, good player. Um, on the left, uh, I didn't play with, I'm going to put Kyle Carey there, but I didn't play with him as much as I'd like. He... He is someone that I feel like I would really connect well with on a football pitch. He's a good player, really good player, really sharp, who likes to create things and stuff. Um, up top, I'm going to go little and large. I'm going to go with pig, um, with pigs, because he's just he just scores goals. Simple as that. Like you give him a chance, nine times out of ten, he's going to put it in the net. Probably not not so good. Not, 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 not so good. Not as good on the ball technically and stuff, but like you have to play to people's strengths. Pigs is a goal scorer. You give him a chance, he's probably going to score. And um, Shaq, Shaquille McDonald, just for the simple fact that another goal scorer, technically really good, will not stop running. They're probably for centre halves, one of the most annoying forwards you can come across. Them small. Nippy lads, which just keep running in behind, stretches the game. And I think him and Pigs would work really well together if they played. So, yeah, that would be my 11. Sorry to the lads that I've left out, like the likes of Robbie P, Ben Valance, Tommy Glasgow, he's a good player, Kev. Oh, my God, Kev. Um, Aaron Wynn, Aaron Apoku. Yeah, I've left out some good players there, but... Yeah, that'll be my 11. I even left that myself. Rance, thank you so much for taking the time out of your very busy schedule to talk to us and best of luck for the new season. Cheers for that, Liam. Really appreciate it, mate. Enjoyed um, enjoyed answering those questions, bud. Um, yeah, thank you very much. All the best to you as well. All the best to everyone at Cov United. Um, hopefully, I'll be seeing you all soon. And... Um, 
you never know what will happen in the future. Thank you to Lewis Rankin for taking time out of his incredibly busy schedule to talk to us here on CUTV. And of course, we wish him the very best of luck for his new campaign with Hinkley or whoever it may be. He really is a top talent and the MFL is lucky to have him. Uh, that's about it from this episode of Team Talk. It's definitely been a long one, um, about an hour's long, uh, if I am correct. And well, we've still got plenty more interviews to come, but we need your help. So let us know who you want to hear from. It can be a past or present star. It can be a goal scorer or a goalkeeper. If you want to hear from a former or current player, then let us know and we will do our very best to make it happen. In the meantime, make sure to hit that like button on YouTube, Facebook or Twitter to let us know that you are enjoying the content. Leave a comment with any feedback that you'd uh, like us to see. Subscribe to CUTV on YouTube more exclusive content. And of course, you can follow us on Twitter at CovUnit. United TV. From me, Liam Cook, thank you very much for watching and we'll see you next time on Coventry United TV.